What does a fertility doctor want you to know before you do IVF? Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and I talk about IVF each and every day over and over again. And there are sometimes patients who come to me from other practices or they've seen other doctors and they've already gone through IVF cycles and they just went in blind. And so this video is going to be what I wish everybody knew before they did IVF, whether it is questions to ask or how to best prepare your body and how to mentally get ready for the process. This channel exists to educate you about your body and your fertility. If you are here and watching and you support my mission and this channel, please subscribe because that just helps these videos get in the hands of more people who really can use this information. So the first thing is that I think you need to understand what IVF is before you undergo the process. Too often I know that doctors don't explain things very well and patients don't know what questions to ask. Your doctor recommends IVF and you just say yes. So the most basic explanation that I can give all relates back to understanding the ovary. You know, I love the ovary. So let's think about that ovary. My favorite analogy is imagining that there's a little vault inside where all your eggs are kept. Every month, a group of eggs is released from the vault. Each egg grows inside a small fluid filled structure called a follicle. The brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. FSH works to stimulate one of these follicles to grow, and as that follicle grows, the egg matures. You eventually will ovulate that egg, all the other eggs that were released from the vault will die, and the next month, another group comes out. A few important things to understand here. IVF, in its simplest, is getting all the eggs that have been released from the vault in that month and stimulating them all to grow. That is considered controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. Then you're going to take those eggs out of the body in an egg retrieval, a small procedure done under anesthesia. And then eggs and sperm are going to come together in the lab and embryos are going to be made that then can be transferred into the body. So really what you're looking for is to get one month's group of eggs to grow and to develop. So what are your expectations? How do you know how many eggs to expect? How does your doctor know what protocol of medications to use? This all comes back to at least understanding your ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is a blanket term for how many eggs you have, but I like to think about it as how many eggs you have coming out of the vault every month. So what we know is when that vault is very full, more eggs come out every month. And when that vault starts to get empty, fewer eggs come out every month. So let's take a person in their 20s, will have about 20 eggs come out of the vault every month. One would naturally ovulate, 19 would die. The next month, another group around 20. In IVF for that person, we want all 20 eggs to grow. So ovarian reserve is counting the eggs, how many are outside the vault. That's called a follicle count or an antral follicle count in AFC, or you can check a blood test called AMH, anti-mullerian hormone. AMH is made from the cells that surround all of those follicles outside the vault. So more eggs inside, more come out, more cells, higher AMH. Fewer inside, fewer come out, lower AMH. This is important because not every 20 year old is going to be the exact same. People have their own levels on where they are on this process of ovarian aging. And so we can check the eggs outside the vault. And that gives us an idea of, first of all, where you are, how close are you getting to the end? How aggressive do we need to be? But also our expectations for the cycle. I'm going to do something different if I think I'll get 20 eggs versus 10 versus five. And you should understand, are we hoping to get 20 eggs or 10 versus five? If you think you're gonna get the exact same eggs as your best friend and you only get five and she got 20, you're gonna be really upset. The point is this process is highly personal. Your body runs out of eggs at its own pace and you deserve to understand what the expectations are for you. For me, that changes the IVF protocol. Number two, understanding your protocol. I'll be really honest. I give an overview of what the protocol is to my patients, and then I wait to know their protocol until I've seen them and I've done that antral follicle count and I've gotten an AMH value. The protocol should be dictated by you, your ovaries, your medical history, and how you've responded to prior cycles. So if you have done an IVF cycle before, we're gonna use that to help gauge what to do next. And if you're getting a second opinion, 
absolutely you need to come with your old protocols in hand if you've gone through cycles because that information is so important for us to help counsel you the best. I like to think about the protocol as suppression and stimulation. These are the combination of the hormones that we do in order to get these eggs to grow. So the way I like to think about it is let's use the 20 egg example. 20 eggs come out of the vault. Your body is made so that one egg ovulates naturally because you're not supposed to carry 20 babies at one time. What this means is that in order to get the ovary to do this, I've got to trick your body in a little bit. I like to lead into most IVF cycles with suppression. Suppression comes in a lot of different forms. It can be with birth control pills, a medication called Lupron, ovulation blockers, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. So it depends. But the take home is that suppression works to tell the brain to stop sending out FSH. So if you have a group of eggs come out of your ovaries, there's no FSH around, they're all gonna get really hungry, and those little receptors for FSH are going to open up. So I like to lead into most IVF cycles with priming the ovaries or suppressing them, kind of synchronizing those stage. That way when I come in with the second phase or the stimulation, stimulation is mostly high doses of FSH. Now that's enough FSH to fill up all those receptors and all of those follicles, and hopefully get that greater number to grow and develop. So the protocol is a combination of suppression and stimulation. We use different doses of medications for stimulation, but for the most part, a high dose of FSH is really the number one thing. You might also have some LH, the other hormone that comes from the pituitary. FSH comes from a synthetic version. It can be called Folistim or Gonal F. They're essentially cousins and work the same. LH only comes from the urine of menopausal women, which has both FSH and LH in it because in menopause, your ovaries don't work. Your brain is trying really hard to get the ovaries to make estrogen. And so they're sending out high doses of FSH and LH. So if you take that urine and you purify it, you get menopure. Mm -hmm. Actually true. So menopure has both FSH and LH in it. And that's the only current LH compound that we have. So if I think a patient needs some LH and depending on your suppression, you may, you'll be taking some menopure. And then other medications can sometimes be used. Sometimes cycles are entered into with letrozole or clomid. This causes the brain to release some natural FSH. So that can sometimes be helpful. And there's also human growth hormone. Human growth hormone is not FDA approved for IVF, but we have seen in studies that patients who have either a prior poor response or a potentially expected poor response based on their characteristics might benefit from some human growth hormone along the way. So something to think about or ask your doctor, especially if you have a prior cycle that did not yield what you want. The third thing, your lifestyle. I think that it's really important that you live your own life while you go through this process, and I hate to deprive you of all the things that make you happy. However, I do think this is not the time to be stressing our body out even more. IVF alone is a stressful process. So I want you to take ownership for what you're investing, your time, your physical energy, your money, your emotional space, and I want you to give IVF in this cycle the respect it deserves. What does this mean? Say no to other obligations if you can. Try not to do IVF when you have the biggest work project due. Try to find ways and time for yourself. Everybody's different, whether it's journaling, meditation, going to therapy, going to acupuncture, going for walks and hearing the birds sing. Whatever might give you a moment of you time to let those cortisol levels drop down and experience a lessening in stress, we know that higher stress levels impact fertility. We know that it impacts your other hormone production, and we've even seen it impact response to a cycle. So when people say, don't stress about being stressed, obviously I don't wanna give you something else to be stressed about, but we can't ignore your whole body and your whole life just because we're doing IVF and act like they don't correlate. Same thing goes for all the lifestyle factors. So I want you to eat healthy. You can do it, you know, this is not the time to binge eat on processed foods and fried foods. I want you to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, vegetable protein is fabulous, but also if you're going to eat animal protein, I prefer it to be things like, you know, fish, things that are high in antioxidants. And I'd like you to avoid red meat or at least it's extremely limited. Red meat has been associated with poor embryo development in some IVF studies. I also want you to think about toxins in your world. So whether that is just, you know, looking at your kitchen and plastics that you're heating up or what you're drinking your coffee out of, but also are you drinking a lot? Are you smoking? Are you using marijuana? Are these things that you're using to escape stress? Are there other 
coping mechanisms that maybe could be more helpful during this time, I want you to consider cutting back on some of those during this process. And then there's some supplements. I see so many people who just roll into IVF and make no change in their life. And that probably works for the vast majority of people. But if you fall into this circumstance where that cycle doesn't go as good as we hoped, and now you have to do another cycle, the last thing I want you to do is look back and say, oh gosh, what could I have done? Could I have done anything different? Would it have made a difference? Maybe yes, maybe no, but I like to control these factors that you can control. And so taking some supplements, do not go supplement crazy. Do not Google supplements for fertility and look up every single thing that could be there. Here's what I recommend and always talk to your doctor to see what they recommend for you because I will tell you, patients with low ovarian reserve, patients who are older, patients who have endometriosis and patients with PCOS, I give them different supplements for those things. But overall, almost all my patients benefit from a prenatal vitamin that's got at least 400 micrograms of folic acid, some omega-3 fatty acids, whether that's in your prenatal vitamin or separate, so that's DHA and EPA, and some extra vitamin D. Most people are vitamin D deficient, so I usually recommend at least 1,000 international units of vitamin D a day. So those are some things that may be in your prenatal or maybe are not. If you happen to be vegan like I am, then some vitamin B12 is going to be really helpful. Three milligrams a day would be fantastic if you can do that. So those all go into you, taking care of you, the body that's going through IVF. Number four is going to be, please don't ignore the male. I see so many people who are like, oh, he's got sperm, that's good enough. And yes, for the most part, IVF overcomes these severe male factors because we only need one sperm per egg, right? We can fertilize one sperm in an egg. So we're able to overcome so much when it comes to sperm count and motility. That's fantastic because naturally you need over 40 million moving sperm to be able to get to the egg and fertilize it. However, sperm quality and function matters too. So a huge one, marijuana use. I have seen really poor outcomes when it comes to embryo development because embryos need the male and the female genome. And sometimes on, you know, going through that WTF appointment, what went wrong with that cycle, it is disclosed at that time, oh, he uses marijuana very often, every day, all the time, cannot cut back. And that's a variable that we may have talked about had we known and tried to talk through it. So definitely looking at heavy alcohol, smoking cigarettes, smoking marijuana, if those things can be changed, it's helpful. Staying at a healthy weight, eating healthy foods, and then avoiding things that can harm the sperm, which is namely like heat. So you don't want to sit in the hot tub or the sauna a lot. Riding a motorcycle can actually increase the heat of the chassis quite a bit. And so can having a laptop in your lap. And then the last thing is really understand how your clinic does IVF. We all do IVF different. But I think it's really important that you have your expectations set. That way you're not disappointed. So some questions to ask your team. Who does the ultrasounds? Is it your doctor? Is it a nurse? Is it an ultrasound tech? If it's not your doctor, who will you talk to about this? Do you ever get feedback? And how do they give you feedback? Is it in the portal? Is it an email? Is it a phone call? How do you understand how the cycle is going? Who is going to talk to you about if the cycle is meeting your expectations? Another important question is, when is monitoring happening? When you go through IVF, it takes about two weeks to get that group of eggs to grow in development before you undergo the egg retrieval. So you come in every two to three days usually for ultrasound and blood work and maybe even every day close to the end of the cycle. Is that going to be in the middle of your work day? Is that at the beginning of the day? What do those appointments look like and how are they structured? Some clinics do this where it's first come first serve. Doors open at 8 a.m., line up outside. You have to wait if you got to the back of the line. That sounds crazy to me. We do it by we block out between 7 to 8.30 in the morning and you have a small little slot and that appointment takes about 15 to 20 minutes and you're in and out. Other clinics do it where they're sprinkled in while the doctor's seeing new patients or doing procedures or other things and you might wait longer. So how much out of your day are you gonna have to give to monitoring? What is the average length of time you're in clinic? When can you start work if you're working? What hours are they happening? So have those expectations set. Another one is about the egg retrieval. Most practices that I've been a part of have it where there's a doctor of the day for procedures. Now, some clinics do it so that your doctor is always able to do your procedures, which sounds awesome. But even now, we do it so that it's either myself or it's my partner, and she and I alternate procedures based on the day. And so we're a partner practice, and we disclose that way up front so that you know that from the very beginning. She and I also 
split monitoring so that you're not meeting one of us for the first time, almost never walking into your egg retrieval. So you've seen that person, they've counseled you, and so we approach this as a team. And the last thing that I want you to know that I see a lot of doctors never talk about with their patients is what is your goal? And making sure that you're making plans for the entire goal, meaning potential future children as well, and not just the right now. I see so many fertility doctors just focused on getting you pregnant right now, and they don't think about the next goal or counseling patients that maybe genetic testing or embryo banking, just saving embryos for the future, may benefit the long-term goal. Or they make presumptions about what a couple may want to do or a person may want to do instead of asking the question. So I love it when doctors ask what your goal is, how many kids do you envision, what's the perfect world if you got to write the book. But if your doctor doesn't, then maybe speak up. I just want you to know, you know, we really want three kids and I know we're getting started a little bit later. Is there anything we should be thinking about now to help us achieve that overall goal? And then sometimes your doctor may talk to you about your goal is unrealistic or what it may take. Patients with a really low ovarian reserve, I often talk to them about, we either need to probably change our goal or be prepared that we're really running a marathon and we're going to need multiple cycles, meaning I can get the eggs out from different months and get a total number that's much higher and improve my odds or my number of embryos. So I could get the eggs from July and then get the eggs that come out of the vault the next month and then get the eggs that come out of the vault the next month. So doing multiple back-to-back -back cycles may improve your total yield if you have a low reserve or you're older or you want multiple kids. And so when you're doing those multiple cycles, you're not running out of eggs any faster. Remember, every month that group of eggs was coming out of the vault, they were either going to ovulate or die, and in IVF, we're simply giving more of them a chance to become children versus not. All right, friends, well, I hope that helped. So this was just some information that I wanted you to know before you begin your IVF cycle. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can check out the podcast, As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. We got a new look for the podcast and a little bit new format. So hope you love it there. Thanks, y'all.